I wonder if I can just place on record, Prime Minister, first of all, our thanks for your coming after a very hectic first few weeks in office, um, but also that your time is under pressure, which means our time is under pressure. If you want to leave on time, please don't, ask, please don't give long answers. We'll keep the questions short. If you keep the answers short, then we'll get you out on time. But if you are too well briefed and you have too many statistics, we will have to detain you. Um, so keep, please keep to the point. Um, we will crack straight on with our first topic, which is um, on international issues, uh, starting with the war in Ukraine. Alicia Kearns. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Prime Minister, if I may, I will take you around the world with as many questions as I have time for. Um, you've ordered a Goldman Sachs-style review of UK support for Ukraine. The media say this is a sign you'll be less steadfast in your support for our Ukrainian allies. The Defence Chair and I would like you to commit today to unreserved support for Ukraine, no matter the outcome of this audit. Yes, I wouldn't necessarily read too much into the press reports. Uh, I'd, I'd look at my actions, I'd say, first of all. I, the first foreign call I made was to President Zelensky. The first bilateral foreign trip I made was to Kyiv. I've spoken to President Zelensky probably a couple more times since then. I've also organised for him to speak to the G7 leaders, also the Jeff leaders, yesterday where I was at the Jeff summit, and committed to maintaining or increasing our military support to Ukraine next year. So those are all the actions to date in the seven or eight weeks that I've been in office. Of course we will continue to support Ukraine. I think both what all of us would want to see is Ukraine successfully uh, repel Russian aggression, and it's important that we maintain support, but also evolve the support for the conditions that we're seeing on the ground in the battlefield, and that's what I'm keen to do. Thank you. Turning to Russia's uh, backers in Iran, Obama's greatest regret from his time in power was not well, was listening to his advisers when they told him not to back the Green Revolution in Iran. Today, the JCPOA is failing. The women of Iran are being brutalised. Iran's committing assassinations across Europe and perpetrating war crimes in Ukraine. How are you standing by the people of Iran? And will you now sanction the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as you promised in the leadership uh, competition over the summer? I think the protests that we're seeing in Iran send a very clear message uh, that the Iranian people aren't satisfied with the path that the government has taken. Uh, we stand very much with the people of Iran. I think the treatment of protesters is quite frankly abhorrent. Uh, that's why the, in terms of actions, this year the Foreign Secretary uh, summoned the most senior Iranian uh, official here to express our view to them and then over the course of three different days on the 9th of December, the 14th of November and the 10th of October, uh, we've sanctioned uh, over almost 40 different individuals connected with the protests, including the so-called morality police. And on the 14th of December, um, we, together with international allies, uh, kicked Iran out of a UN commission on the status of women. And on the IRGC specifically, which you've Yeah, so we on. already sanctioned the IRGC in its entirety, and typically we wouldn't comment on, uh, conscription, uh, on prescription. I, I believe you've prescribed them but not sanctioned them. No, we, we sanctioned the IRGC in its entirety. Uh, the separate list of terrorist organisations that are prescribed is kept under review and we generally wouldn't comment on <coughs> prescriptions. Why, move, why won't you comment? Because we wouldn't comment on processes that may or may not be underway. It's a frustrating Foreign Office quirk. Um, the security services have rightly identified China as our greatest national security challenge, but we have no strategic uh, coherence on this. We have fallen short putting forward key resilience strategies. We failed to protect refugees on British soil from Chinese uh, diplomat brutality. You promised to change China policy on day one, if you were made Prime Minister. So how have you done that? Uh, just before we go to China, just to finish on Iran, it's worth saying, whilst Russia and Ukraine remains our number one foreign policy uh, challenge as we go into the new year. I am increasingly concerned uh, about Iran's behavior, the treatment of their citizens, their regional, you know, what I'd say, you know, their, what they're doing in the region which is destabilizing and indeed the nuclear program. So I think it's something that we'll need to spend an increasing amount of time on uh, going forward. Now, with regard to China again, um, I, I would just say, look, and we've, I've been doing this seven or eight weeks, and if we just look very practically at the steps that we've taken in that time, I, I've always been clear that China represents a um, you know, systematic challenge to our values, it has very different values to ours, but what matters is the actions that we are taking, and there's a handful. First and foremost, 
we use the powers under the National Security and Investment Act to block uh, the increased stake in Newport Wafer Fab. Secondly, when it came to the decision to green light Sizewell, we ensured that the Chinese state nuclear uh, company was no longer going to be a part of that project. Um, thirdly, it's, uh, we've removed surveillance uh, from the HMG estate, which is connected with the national intelligence law in China. And then most recently as well, we've, um, we've had organized 50 other countries in the UN uh, for a resolution in the committee regarding Xinjiang. Let, those are all concrete steps in just the last seven or eight weeks that we have taken, which I think demonstrates my commitment to stand up to China where it's in our interest to do so. So where that takes us back to your policy of robust pragmatism, how does our dependence on China, how much does that keep you up at night when rowing up your ability to be robust rather than just pragmatic? Yeah, so I mean, uh, the, the actions that I just outlined are all robust actions. We talked about resilience and uh, that's why we didn't think it was appropriate for the Newport, the Newport wafer fab transaction to go ahead as planned. We blocked it. That's why we've removed the surveillance technology from the HMG estate. That's why we've removed uh, CGN from the Sizewell project. Those are e examples of robust action to protect ourselves against economic and other threats. You know, I, all I'd say is it's also important that our approach to China is aligned with our closest allies, having discussed it with President Biden, indeed the Prime Ministers of Japan and Australia. I believe that our policy is aligned, uh, and, and there will be many things that we do have to have a dialogue with China on, whether that's global public health, climate change, or, or the macro economy, uh, it makes sense to do that. Um, and very finally, Chair, we seem to have a real issue tying down our policy when it comes to our relationship with Turkey. Um, they've been an important uh, conduit between Europe and Russia over the last few months. But since 2019, Erdogan has carried out attack after attack on the Kurdish people. He's now claiming he's going to roll in the tanks to eradicate them. This could A, jeopardise our success against Daesh, and B, see atrocities prevented en masse. So what is HMG doing under your leadership to step in to deter Turkey from undertaking these heinous attacks? I, you know, I, I've spoken to the President both at the International <coughs> Summit we were both at, but also bilaterally as well. We'll continue to use all our offices uh, to encourage Turkey to do the right thing. And, and most recently, we worked constructively with them on ensuring that grain for the great Black Sea grain deal was renewed, and that was something that they helped play a part in. Thank you. A couple of questions quickly of my own. Um, it is, of course, astonishing that we allowed China to carry on doing what they were doing for so long, and uh, we're certainly, I'm certainly, for one, pleased with the direction the government's taking. But coming back to Russia, um, this, the Defence Secretary made a statement this afternoon pointing out this is the 300th day of the war that was meant to take a few days and has been militarily disastrous for Russia. But are we underestimating their will? What do you make of Russian willpower? Because they are putting everything into the fight. The Russian doctrine of, of total war and victory at any cost seems to be very apparent. Yeah, and that's why it's important that we continue to maintain and increase our support to Ukraine and make sure that that support is effective in deterring further Russian aggression and pushing them back from the territory that they've already seized. Uh, and that's what we'll continue to and do. How much is that as sh shared as deeply as you with our European allies? Uh, that, I mean, that's why I was at the Jeff Summit yesterday. Uh, that's 10 countries very like-minded on values, but particularly with regard to the threat that Russia poses. Uh, and again, very strong consensus about what we need to do next year, uh, whether it's the specific types of military support needed. Uh, those are the types of things we discussed yesterday, and those conversations I've had more broadly as well. And the defence chair, if he was here, would be asking, what's happened to the lessons learned document in the Ministry of Defence about uh, lessons learned on the Ukraine conflict, particularly about replenishing our munitions, which the Defence Secretary said will be replenished, not are being replenished, and of course the resilience of our munitions supply chains, which are, have turned out to be very threadbare. What are we doing about that? It needs money. Uh, yes, and we are replenishing our munitions. I think, as the Defence Secretary probably acknowledged, as you just acknowledged as well, Bernard, the issue is less money than it is supply chain capacity in the short term. Uh, that is the challenge. I mean, that is, that is a gating or limiting factor on our ability to get some of the support we'd like to see flowing uh, to Ukraine happening quicker. But one thing, you know, is uh, the point right at the beginning is we need to make sure that we get them what they need. The priorities at the moment are air defense, armored vehicles, and uh, artillery 
and munitions, the contract that we've just signed, £250 million, will ensure that there's a ready supply of artillery next year, uh, but also on a monthly basis so Ukraine can plan with certainty, which they haven't always been able to do because of the supply chain. Our contract that we've put in place will give them that certainty and reliability next year, which will be helpful. Thank you. Clive Betts for uh, Leveling Up Committee. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, Prime Minister. I'm going to talk about the uh, situation with Ukrainian refugees in this country. I'm sure all our thoughts this Christmas will be with our Ukrainian guests, and particularly children who are going to be spending Christmas in a foreign country thinking of their loved ones back in Ukraine. Uh, and also thanks to the wonderful hosts who have hosted 100,000 Ukrainian individuals in our country. Unfortunately, uh, 3,000 Ukrainian families have presented themselves as homeless in the last six months, and many of those families, including children, will spend Christmas in temporary accommodation. Is that really acceptable, Prime Minister, we should get to that situation in a wealthy country like we are? Well, I think the first thing to, to say, is, as you did, Clive, is to express our gratitude and admiration for the thousands of British families who have opened up their hearts and homes to uh, accommodate Ukrainian refugees. As I said previously, many of them will be setting an extra place at their Christmas table um, in, a, in a week's time, and that is enormously to their credit. Now, the way that we did this was through the Homes for Ukraine scheme, as, as you know, and that was with sponsor families uh, taking people in. Uh, the announcement that we made just recently extends the thank you payments to those families for a further 12 months, also increases them from £350 a month to £500 a month. And, and to your other point, we've provided, I think, about £150 million of funding to local authorities to help mitigate homelessness uh, in the second year. Well, it will mitigate. It certainly won't solve the problem of uh, homeless refugees because we've got the Afghan refugees as well on top of that. But you mentioned the, the payments to, to sponsors. Um, Richard Harrington, when he was minister, said that the pay payments should be doubled. Um, you know, last week, the government announced an increase from 350 to 500 pounds um, a month for families, but only after one year. Uh, on the committee, we've met uh, Ukrainian uh, hosts of Ukrainian uh, families who are thinking about giving up after six months, and the pressure of the cost of living is one of those issues. Prime Minister, can't you just be a bit more generous, increase the payments a bit more, and bring them forward to stop homelessness increasing amongst refugees? It's worth bearing in mind that it's not just payments to the families that the government is making, it's also payments to local authorities. As you'll be familiar, there's a tariff of over £10,000, uh, which has meant over a billion pounds of funding has also uh, been flowing to local authorities to help them uh, with preparations. Uh, but the Housing Secretary has also made available half a billion pounds in funding for a local authority housing fund. To, that's, that's for capital funding to areas that are facing a significant housing pressure as a result of Ukrainian arrivals. Uh, and that will help alleviate some of the pressures uh, that we're seeing. We're also enabling a rematching scheme where Ukrainian guests can find new sponsors after their initial six months, uh, and we're providing guidance in both Ukrainian and Russian to help households access the private rental sector. Well, you just mentioned the help to local authorities, Prime Minister, which was £10,500 per person per year, but you've just cut it from January the 1st to £5,900 for new arrivals. So if, if £10,500 was the right figure uh, this year, why is only £5,900 the right figure next year? Well, it's a, it's a combination of things. First of all, there, there are some costs that are front-loaded. You'll know that, speaking to local authorities. Uh, but also, it's a question of what we can afford across the board. Uh, as, as alluded to at the beginning, this is all going on for longer than people have anticipated. We want to increase some of the payments to individual families providing shelter. Your first questions are about not making sure that those families are homeless or put in temporary accommodation. So we've increased those payments, um, but I think it's reasonable over time that payments to local authorities change. Also worth bearing in mind that we have provided six and a half billion pounds in extra <coughs> funding that will be made available to local government more generally as a result of the autumn statement. So but, that but, is new funding going into local government, which I assume we'll, we'll talk uh, about soon too. Last question. Yes, uh, but as a, an ex-local government minister, you'll know that local councils have had bigger cuts to their budgets than any other part of the public sector uh, <coughs> over the last 12 years. Uh, so there's a, there's a cut to the amount of money local authorities are going to receive for the sponsored families. 
uh, the local authorities get nothing at all to refugees who come under the family scheme, though they have to provide all the services, including children's services as well. So why should local citizens, through their councils, have to have cuts, further cuts to their libraries, their bus services, uh, their street sweeping services, for what is, is an international and a national problem? Shouldn't it be central government that picks up this cost and not local councils? Central government is picking up no, the a total considerable cost. amount of the cost and the total funding cost. to local government, as, uh, as you'll be familiar, as we used to discuss this in our other committee, yeah. for the last two years has been going up uh, at, at very significant levels. But why so, no money for the family scheme at all, Prime Minister? I mean, there, there, is, there is considerable overall funding going into local There's no government. money for the family scheme at all, uh, is there? Overall, into local government, there's six and a half There's no money for the family scheme so. at all. Well, I think you've made your point. Okay. Um, Dame Diana Johnson. Uh, from the Home Affairs Select Committee report into small boats, which was published in the summer, it was clear that the asylum backlog had been allowed to grow since 2013 and was an Achilles heel, really, in its weakness and undermining everything else. So the top recommendation in our report was to clear the backlog. 13th of December, <coughs> uh, you say to Parliament, we expect to abolish the backlog of initial asylum decisions by the end of next year. So a really bold claim. Can you just confirm the number that you plan to abolish by the end of next year? Yes, it's, um, it's the initial asylum backlog uh, with up to June the 28th, which is when the NADA came into uh, effect, which separated the pool of asylum seekers, and from memory it's 90-something thousand. So it's 92,000, not the 120,000 that we currently have in the... 117,000 was the total number at the time I made the statement, but that is comprised of the 92, okay. which is the pre june at which point the NABA separates and distinguishes okay. between the same. So it's not actually abolishing the backlog, is it? How, uh, how it is, many... It's abolishing... Uh, well, no, uh, if we can go further... But it's not course, abolishing, I think uh, that's well, the key I, point. I think it would represent one of the most significant reductions okay. in the backlog that we've seen. Thank and, you. and as I said, if we can go further, I'd absolutely like to. Right, OK. How many small boats do you envisage will be coming to the UK in 2023? I, 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 I wouldn't, I, it wouldn't be possible for me to put a precise number on it. I've been very clear that this problem is not an easy one to solve. It's complicated and it can't be solved overnight. Um, but what I do know is that the steps that we are taking already and we intend to take will make a difference. <coughs> OK, so, so the Home Office this year, we're planning for up to 60,000 people to come across in small boats. But you're saying there isn't a figure for next year? Uh, I don't have it to hand. That, that okay. I'm, thought, I'm sure there is a planning figure, but you're asking me what I think will actually happen. There's okay. a reasonable worst case scenario that they what? plan to, which is different to what I can precisely tell you will happen, because obviously that will be a function of, of many things. What do you expect the backlog to be in December 23, then? I said it's a, it would be a function of, of arrivals which are uncertain, but I can tell you the initial asylum backlog is what we're keen to clear over the course of next year, and we'll do that by tripling the productivity of our Well, I'll case come workers. on to that. Yes, I'd like to ask you about that. But do you yeah. think that anyone will be mate, waiting for more than six months at the end of next year to have their asylum I, th I think as, as well as clearing the initial asylum backlog, what we're keen to do is look at the end-to-end -end process it takes us to process claims and see how we can shrink that. Uh, and that, I think, will actually, as I've made the point before, at the moment, the, the process is such that it can be used by people to extend it and stretch it out, and I want to make sure that that system isn't being okay. abused or exploited, and that's some of the legislative changes that we'll look can at. Can I just press you then on, about what you've said, which is that you're going to, in order to clear the, the backlog, you're going to double the workforce, you're going to triple productivity, and you're going to re-engineer the system. So what I know is the Home Office struggle when they make targets for themselves, and, and I am worried that there's some kind of fairy tale figures uh, in this. They fail to uh, meet their target of getting 1,000 caseworkers in 2021. 46% of caseworkers left in 2021. The pilot the Home Office have produced to increase productivity went from 1.2 decisions per week per caseworker to up to 2.7 per caseworker per week. The IT systems are poor, and in the judges in the Rwanda case just yesterday talked about the poor administration in the Home Office. So I wondered what evidence you've actually <coughs> used to base your target on of being able to, uh, to reduce the, the asylum backlog. That's it. Two, two things. One is we have already doubled the case working workforce over the past 12 months, so that's one proof point. And the second is we've taken an extensive exercise to map the process end to end. And on the basis of a bunch of modelling that has been done that's relatively sophisticated, that's where the estimate of a tripling of the productivity comes from. 
But, okay, so I only know about the pilot that the Home Office have been running, but there's something else that they've been doing then. Well, obviously, when I, when I stood up, I said we had looked at the entire process end to end okay. uh, and identified steps in the process that we think we can streamline, remove, or tweak, and on the basis of modelling that you would expect to do when you're doing systems engineering, that's what gives you the, the trip. Okay, let's there. hope the Home Office can, uh, can actually uh, achieve that. So, um, I just want to ask you about Rwanda. What's the actual target for how many people you're planning to send to Rwanda by the end of 23? Well, I, I think we expect further legal challenge. We'll continue to uh, pursue that as uh, necessary. And it's one of the many things that we want to Do pursue. You, you don't have a figure? Because well, the, the, the Rwandan government are talking about 200. I'd say like, we, we haven't commented on a, what is a commercial contract, uh, and rightly so. Uh, but what okay. we're keen to do is have a system which we move to, whereas if someone comes here illegally, they don't have the right to stay and we have the okay. right to remove them. Can Rwanda is a part of that, as will new legislation be, and I, I, I welcome the fact that the okay. court recognised that the policy is uh, What's lawful. the budget that you've allocated? Nice question. What's the budget you've allocated for the Rwanda policy? I think we, 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 we've said clearly that there's a £120 million payment uh, for economic development. That's already been paid, plus and, the and £20 million this yes, year as well. 20, yeah. So 140 that's it? There's no more money so to be paid to Rwanda? Uh, uh, there's, there's nothing else that we've said publicly or will in a commercial And contract. just very finally, if I could just very ask, do you think the Permanent Secretary was right to actually say there was no evidence of value for money with the Rwanda scheme? Uh, I, I believe the Rwanda scheme represents an important part of our plan to tackle <coughs> illegal migration and stop small boats. It's not the only part of it, but it's an important part of it. That's why I welcome the court decision yesterday. Thank you. Thank you very good. Prime Minister, you've said that um, uh, the aim is that anybody who arrives here illegally will not stay here. Um, and some lawyers are advising you that that can be done without setting aside any aspects of the ECHR or the Human Rights Act. Others are saying it cannot be done. How are you going to judge that question? Because if you take the wrong advice and they keep arriving and staying, uh, that won't add much credibility to your objective. <coughs> As I said, we'll, we'll introduce legislation in the new year which will achieve the aim that I set out. Uh, and the legislation is one part of an overall plan that I set out to Parliament recently and I'm confident that we can deliver on that plan and it will make a difference and reduce the number of votes arriving. And on the question of the ECHR? I said we'll introduce legislation in the new year which <coughs> will deliver on the system that I said I would. Anybody else want to follow that one up? Um, Philip Dunn. Prime Minister, I'm going to ask you some questions about the, your government's environmental commitments and how you're going to deliver them. Uh, following the conclusion of the COP27 conference, which I was pleased you attended, I asked you on the floor of the House how you were going to uh, personally ensure that as the structures for COP26 were dismantled with the teams and the structures of government changing, uh, how were you going to deliver our nationally determined contributions? And you said you would personally drive it through government. You're not chairing the one cabinet committee that had some direct responsibility for this. So how are you doing that? I, I think a couple of things, Philip. First of all, that, that cabinet committee, those decisions still come to me uh, as part of the collective agreement process. So I think ultimately I'm the ultimate decision maker. And the second thing, the number 10 team are intimately involved in all aspects of it, whether that's the, um, my office sitting on that committee specifically, the delivery unit process currently going over all the targets we have uh, and the policy unit involved with departments. And I think probably the, the third thing I'd say is, again, judging me by my actions, we've been doing it seven or eight weeks, and in that time I've already <coughs> worked closely with cabinet ministers on various aspects of net zero, whether that's on and offshore wind, nuclear, and indeed energy efficiency, where I've specifically uh, got involved as we've been developing policy there and making announcements. The government lost uh, a case in the High Court in relation to its net zero uh, strategy. Are you involved in the review to refresh that strategy by the end of March? Yes, uh, I'll be doing that uh, over the Christmas holidays because we intend to uh, obviously um, respond to the High Court demand and indeed Chris Skidmore's net zero review. We'd like to do those <coughs> ideally together and I'm going over exactly that over the next uh, over the Christmas period. Good. Well, he's a valued member of our committee, so we'll be pleased to get him back once that work's finished. Are you receiving regular updates on nationally determined contributions and how we're getting on with those? Hmm. Yes, and it said I'll be reviewing all of that with the delivery unit again for the Christmas as part of our reply to the High Court judgment and Chris's report. Okay. 
Uh, the COP15 Global Biodiversity Conference just finished in Montreal, uh, with, which has been widely applauded. Uh, our commitments under that include uh, commitments to protect habitats and species. How do you intend to deliver on those targets by 2030? Yeah, I, if I just actually, if you don't mind, uh, Philip, just pay tribute to um, Therese Coffey and Zach Goldsmith and indeed Will Lockhart and the rest of the team for their efforts. Something everyone can be proud of, the UK demonstrated real leadership. Uh, we did, in, under our COP presidency, by putting nature at the heart of how we'll meet our climate objectives. And I think we followed that up in Montreal and that was recognised by leaders around, uh, around the world. In, in terms of delivery on it, I, I think there's what we will have is an environmental improvement plan which will be published early in 2023, which will mean that progress can be monitored and the government can be held accountable for the actions to recover nature. Uh, we obviously have a legally binding set of targets recently we've published as part of our World Leading Environment Act and uh, you know, I'm excited to get on and deliver that because it can make an enormous difference and it's something where we are you know, unequivocally leading the world in. But I think we're leading the world in designating areas, both in, on land and the marine uh, environment that we're responsible for through our overseas territories and around our, our waters around the UK, um, but much less so in enforcement. There have been a lot of concerns from NGOs in particular that the enforcement of our regulatory agencies uh, lacks teeth, lacks resources, and therefore lacks enforcement. Are you able to respond to that by providing more resource for enforcement? Um, well... I'm not, I'm not familiar with the specific uh, concern. I know certainly on, on water pollution and sewage, for example, we've given Ofwat considerably more powers as part of the legislation that we passed where they can levy fines of up to, from memory, I think £250 uh, million pounds, um, at the outset, which is an example of us beefing up the regulators where we think that there's a problem. So it's not something that we've shied away from where we think it's <coughs> necessary. Um, then it's something I'd, I'd happy to keep an eye on. It's, I, I don't disagree with you. We need to be able to enforce the rules that we set. That's what we've done with Ofwat. And if there are other ways we need to do that, I'd happily look at that, as I'm sure the Secretary of State would, if appropriate. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Harriet Baldwin on economic issues now. Thank you, Chair. Prime Minister, Inflation is clearly the biggest economic challenge facing our country at the moment and the blame for that, most of it, can be squarely laid at the uh, doors of the Kremlin. But when you were Chancellor, there clearly were inflationary pressures emerging even both before the uh, invasion of Ukraine and the Bank of England was running a very loose monetary policy but you were running a very loose fiscal policy. Can you tell us what you most regret about your time as Chancellor? Uh, I, I actually, when it comes to fiscal policy, I think I, think I was getting criticism for uh, tightening fiscal policy ahead of others because I specifically made the point about inflation and interest rate risk at a time when many people were telling me I could rely on rock bottom interest rates forever and borrowing was fine and we could spend what we liked. And I didn't think that that was right, said that it wasn't right and that's why I think in spring of 2021, I talked about it towards the end of 2020 and in spring 2021, introduced a set of measures to actually start putting the public finances on a much more sustainable track. And at the time, many people said that we were the first country to do that and it wasn't necessary. So I think on that, actually, I'm, I'm proud of the record uh, that I have. No one gets these things perfectly right. I'm not pretending I did, but I, I, I do think that we were right to identify that as a risk and take steps earlier than others did uh, to start mitigating it. And, um, you know, I think in, in terms of other regrets I have, I, the one thing that um, it was more apparent, well, in hindsight, that uh, it's still a tricky thing to fix, and I think it might be that uh, Stephen wants to talk about it a bit later, is inactivity. And I think that uh, it's just what was going on in the labour market um, that not caught anyone, everyone by surprise. Uh, and again, all very well in hindsight, but at the time everyone thought when furlough ended and things like that, there would be mass unemployment and I was getting criticism for ending furlough. Um, uh, to, that wasn't the issue, and the issue was very much on the other end where the labour market was not as large as we would like it to be. Now, had, had we known about that earlier, I wonder if there are things we could have done to stop people leaving, because it's always better to stop people leaving the labour market than to try and attract them back once they've left. Um, I'm not sure there are obvious answers, but that's something that, that clearly we, we need to address now. 
but you do know about that issue now, and yet the Chancellor in the autumn statement announced next year's cost of living payment uh, of £900. The committee welcomes the fact that that has been uh, increased and announced, but it will apply to only those on means-tested benefits, which means that someone who moves out of that means test and earns £1 extra will lose £900 uh, in terms of that cost of living payment. So that's a ridiculous cliff edge that plausibly you're now baking into the system that could act as uh, a way in which people could be very much disincentivized from uh, entering uh, the labor market at, a, at higher pay. And uh, we published a report last week on that, uh, recommending that those cliff edges be uh, uh, dealt with. And do you support our recommendations? Um, I, th I think, when you're, when you're dispensing that type of support, I, the scale, it's a third of all households are in receipt of it. Um, it you have to do things that are also operationally deliverable and, and simple. I, I, I totally acknowledge the point that like wherever you have an eligibility criteria that you know, it won't be perfect. Um, I think I'd probably say there's three things. One is it's not a single payment partly to address the concern that you raised, Harriet, it, it's two payments split. So that straight away means that people can, who flow in and out of benefits, as many people do, have, uh, well, we're, have two we're bites of the apple. We're recommending six, I, I, Again, yeah. and that's the question then on operational mm. delivery and what actually is, is possible for DWP to administer without having people waiting a long time and getting it right. I think the second thing is you can also appeal your benefit, in benefit entitlement on the qualifying date, and if it's found to have been successful, you'll have a backdated payment. And the third thing is always to remember is there is a very significant discretionary element through the household support fund of an extra billion pounds, which is well able and deliberately in place to pick up those um, those hard cases. So I think that those are three you know, significant mitigations against uh, the concern that you have. And, and nothing is going to be perfect when you come to these things. It's just a trade-off between what's deliverable uh, and how do we balance the different things that we have to Speaking of things not being perfect, baked into the Chancellor's autumn statement is the assumption that fuel duty is going to rise by 12 pence uh, in the spring. I'm sure you would want to confirm today to the committee that that's not going to happen. Having, having previously had his job, I always preferred it when the Prime Minister made absolutely no comments about future tax policy, mm -hmm. and so I will very much adhere to that. But it's £6 billion a year during a cost of living crisis, so you're not going to let the Chancellor get away with 12 I, pence. I, I, I'm going to let, the, I, I'm gonna let the Chancellor make the policy on fiscal uh, decisions and announce them in the normal way. Well, don't you think that as someone who, as you rightly point out, as Chancellor had to deal with the fact that these are always baked into the numbers and you have to then reverse them, that we ought to come up with a better approach to fuel duty? No, I, I, as, whether I was Chancellor or, or as Prime Minister, I'd say exactly the same thing, but tax decisions are those that are made by the Chancellor in fiscal statements, and that's the way it should be. Okay, and moving, on 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 that definitely is, of those. <laughs> moving on to something that's definitely quick, in your responsibility, uh, the refinancing of Ukraine and the assets that we've rightly sanctioned here in the UK. Uh, what is your view at this moment about how... Uh, the, the UK can play a leading role in helping to raise the finance uh, to rebuild Ukraine, including that um, potentially of the Central Bank of Russia? Uh, I'll, a quick answer would be, I think we've played a leading role so far uh, through leveraging uh, multilateral development bank uh, financing. I think 1.25 billion has been unlocked from the World Bank and others as a result of our guarantees and other support. Uh, that's something we'll look to con continue to look to do more of uh, and we're hosting a reconstruction conference this year. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Next year, sorry, I meant. On with the cost of living crisis with the Work and Pensions Committee Chair, Stephen Timms. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, <clears throat> to nobody's surprise, food bank demand rose sharply last year and your very welcome decision to operate benefits <laughs> fully in line with inflation next April will help make sure that doesn't get significantly worse next year. But you said in the Conservative Party leadership contest that you, quote, want to build a country where ideally nobody needs to use a food bank. Is that a realistic prospect, do you think? Yes, I'd, I'd like to think so. And I think it's, as I said at the time, happy to, to repeat, it's, uh, you know, it's sad that anyone needs to <coughs> use a food bank, but at the same time, 
you know, I'm grateful to the people that provide those services, many of them in our constituencies, and, and it's very important, and uh, I'm grateful to them that they do. How long do you think it'll take to end the need for food banks? Uh, well, I, you know, I think we, it's important for us to get the economy growing again. The best way to do that is to have an economy that's growing, providing opportunity for people uh, and enable those uh, to support those who, who can't work. And that's why all the other things we're doing to strengthen our public finances and reduce inflation is paramount uh, to getting to that point. And in the short term, we've got a range of different support for, for people, particularly with food, whether that's free school meals, a holiday activity and food program and others, um, that will help provide people with the extra assistance, particularly this winter. Do you envisage increasing access to free school meals? No, I think our free school meals policy is universal, as you know, for, for infants. Uh, there's then around 1.9 million who receive uh, free school meals. Uh, beyond that... But Extending to junior schools? Uh, I think the provision we have is... is the right provision but on top of that we have the holiday activity and food program which costs about 200 million pounds a year and provides uh, food and activity provision outside of turn time also breakfast clubs that have been rolled out across um, many schools which are helping in the mornings uh, but also something called healthy start vouchers which don't get a lot of attention where we increased uh, by quite a significant amount <coughs> the value of those vouchers and they pr they allow uh, pregnant uh, mothers or indeed uh, new mothers to get extra support for fresh fruit and milk, for example. Do, do you anticipate food bank demand will have reduced by the time of the next election? I, you know, I, very, I very much hope so, because I, I hope that we can actually get the economy growing um, over the course of uh, the, the remainder of this parliament, and, and that's something that I'll work very hard to do. And, and do you recognise that on the way to eradicating the need for food banks, that we will need to improve the social security safety net beyond what's provided at the moment? Well, I think if you if you look if you look at the stats, I think income inequality is lower um, in the last reported numbers than it was in 2010. There's over a million fewer people in in poverty. Um, and uh, several hundred thousand fewer workless households, yeah. and ultimately the, the surest route out of poverty is, is not for a child to grow up in a in a workless household. So actually, I think there's been enormous progress on on all those fronts. But I think on, on food bank usage in particular, we need to get a better understanding of it, which is why I, I think it's important that it's being included for the first time in the DWP family resources survey, uh, so we'll start to get better data on food bank usage, which we haven't had to date. I mean, I just, the, the, throughout all those things, food bank demand has continued to rise, except then you increased universal credit by £20 a week, and, th and then it did. So that's why I say I think that we will need to see an improvement in the social security safety net it, it, to achieve the, the eradication that you, you've held out. Can I just mention a, a, a couple of dr current drivers of food bank? demand is the local housing allowance is frozen at its 2020 level so when rent goes up people have to dip into the rest of their benefits to pay the rent um, disabled people depending on equipment have obviously much higher electricity costs at the moment um, and 290,000 people claiming disability benefits have recently lost eligibility to the warm homes discount scheme I wonder if in any of those three there are is any prospect of further help being provided? Well, I'll keep giving short answers, but on the local housing allowance, it was increased by a third, and that was worth about 600 and odd pounds for in, one and a half million people. That's a very significant cash uplift at the time, which is appropriate to have then uh, maintained. Uh, on on um, the warm homes discount, again, from memory, uh, it was targeted to actually <coughs> properly targeted on those who most needed help. It was actually increasing the means, I haven't got the stats to hand, it was increasing the means testing of the benefit, actually delivering it to people who, who yeah. most needed uh, the help. And, and I recognise the extra costs of, um, of those who need uh, devices to help them with disabilities, which is why one of the cost of living payments is £150 to those in receipt of means tested disability payments, uh, because that will sit alongside the pensioner payment and the general cost of living payment, especially to take account of the, the fact that you just raised. A final point of I am HR. The Select Committee has published today a report on support for childcare costs in universal credit. Um, you'll recognise that uh, supporting the costs of childcare is a, a big concern for MPs in your party and across the, the House. Um, at the moment, the maximum support for one child is capped at the level that was first set in 2005, £760 per month. Um, isn't it high time that that cap was uprated? 
Um, I think, uh, as far as I recall, it's actually it's said that eighty five percent of eligible childcare costs are reimbursable. So it's quite, a, I mean, it's quite a high threshold, eighty five percent. And I'm from to memory, it is. I, I don't have the stats, and I'll happily get back to Stephen. I, I think there are very, very few people at the cap. So I, I absolutely appreciate the importance of childcare. Um, I, I'm not sure the cap is the thing to necessarily focus on because it affects, I think, from memory, a, a small number of people. But I happily have a look. Well, increasingly, Sorry, it is, you'll have to as, stop as costs are, uh, costs are rising. Thank you. Um, could I bring um, Robin Walker, the chair of the Education Committee, in very briefly on the matter of childcare? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Prime Minister, you yourself have said inactivity is one of the big uh, issues that has risen since your time as Chancellor and one of the big challenges we face. Would you agree that better supporting childcare is one of the ways of uh, combating that, bringing people back into the workplace and supporting people? And with that in mind, the fact that the tax-free childcare, which is supported by the Treasury, only about one in five people who are, uh, children who are eligible for childcare have taken it up. And of those who've opened accounts for tax-free childcare, only about half of them are used. Is that a concern for you? Yes. I mean, I started work on that when I was Chancellor. I know that work is ongoing. Uh, how to improve the take-up of the existing childcare offers, which are not always well understood, um, particularly tax-free childcare and the accounts, as you mentioned, uh, Robin. Uh, that, that work is ongoing. I think, actually, they're, they're changing. Uh, we're changing both the promotional material, how we explain it, and how easy it is for people to access and what they can use it on. I, I, the, I just make the obvious comment, of course there's always work to do. We do have one of the um, uh, lowest rates of inactivity among women and actually female participant in the, participation in the labour force in the UK uh, has gone up far more than most other countries um, and other people ask us how we've done it but there is of course more to do which is why we continue to refine and improve the childcare offers. And uh, finally, thank you, Chairman. Just uh, 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 the early years have become more and more important part of education. Our understanding of the benefits of investment in the early years has improved over time. Uh, the IFS recently confirmed that early years spending has actually gone up, unlike other parts of the um, uh, uh, education spending over the last 10 years. But do you think that trend is likely to continue? Uh, certainly, if I have anything to do with it, I think the early years are very important, and that's why, as Chancellor, I prioritised funding them in the last spending review that I did. Uh, particularly the work that Andrea Ledsom uh, had done, I thought was uh, instructive and I've asked her to carry on doing that. Um, and that work is being rolled out across local authorities, but you're right, I think all the evidence is clear. If we can intervene earlier and support children earlier, it makes a big difference. Um, we can't reorient the system overnight, but incrementally directing more resource there, I think it's a good and sensible thing to do. Catherine McKennell for the Petitions Committee. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to pick you up on a comment that you've made there about increasing women's participation in the workforce, is he, is he aware that um, between the ages of 25 and 39, the number of women dropping out of the workforce is going up, not down, and it's increasing, and all the progress that's been made over many years in this country is actually going backwards on that front. So he should look at those statistics very carefully. Um, there's also very clear statistics that the number of mothers considering leaving their jobs is quite significant and many are cutting down their hours due to the cost of childcare and the fact that ultimately many pay to work um, and this is obviously a significant cost to the economy and Prime Minister you mentioned earlier that there are you know a tight labour market and this is a difficult issue to solve. Might I suggest that one way to solve it would be to actually make it affordable for women to stay in the workplace. Yeah, the, the point I was making, which I think stands, is that inter, if you look internationally, uh, we rank as a country with relatively high levels of uh, female participation in the labour force. That That's a fact. Of, of course, there's always work to do, and it might well be that it's moved down over the last year. I haven't got those numbers to hand. But internationally, it's something that we have done better than, uh, than others. Uh, in terms of the inactivity, and we'll continue, as I said already, to continue looking at our offers to see what more we can do um, to support those who, with child caring responsibilities to work if, if that's what they want to do. Uh, the inactivity problem that we're, we're seeing most recently is, is not, as far as I am aware, driven by an increase in um, uh, uh, child carers leaving the workforce. It is much more driven by those over 50 
uh, and by an increase in, in student activity, but particularly the over 50s are the, are the biggest reason for the increase in economic activity. Yeah, because they have caring responsibilities, which is another issue uh, that, that needs to be addressed. Uh, it's, not, it's not obvious that they do. It's not a, it's not a problem that is completely well understood, um, but it is uh, a mix of uh, lifestyle decisions, ill health actually coming up uh, and other reasons. It's yep. not necessarily for caring responsibilities. And um, I mean, just in terms of your international ratings, we also rate one of the highest, most expensive childcare systems in the world. So he should also bear that in mind. Just in relation to the healthy start vouchers that he mentioned earlier as um, a flagship announcement and scheme, um, often mentioned by the government, but I've asked four times this year for the take up of that scheme since it was digitised in April, because a lot of families expressed challenges around managing the new digitised system. I even asked at Treasury questions today, they couldn't give a figure. Does the Prime Minister have a figure for how many actually use the scheme? Uh, I don't, but I'd happily write to the committee with the answer. Good, that would be helpful, um, thank you. Is the Prime Minister also aware that the Petitions Committee led a debate in Parliament yesterday on child bed poverty? that there's a, a teacher, head teacher, deputy head teacher in Leeds who's established a charity to provide beds for children because they're struggling to concentrate at school. Is he not ashamed that that is a reality for children growing up in Britain today? Uh, well, what I'm keen to make sure is that we don't have children who are growing up in poverty. All the evidence is crystal clear that the best way to do that is to ensure that children don't grow up in a workless household. And if you can achieve that, they're five times less likely to grow up in poverty, which is why I'm pleased that there are several hundred thousand fewer households uh, that are like that compared to when um, uh, except the government first came into office. Uh, and that's why ensuring that we can support people into good, well-paid jobs, and make sure that we continue increasing the national living wage is really important, because that is the best way to ensure that children don't grow up in poverty. That's what I want to see. We've made great progress. There are hundreds of thousands of fewer children uh, in poverty today than in 2010, but of course I want to keep uh, keep driving that number down. So I just don't recognise what the Prime Minister said. It seems to be a parallel reality because the number of children living in poverty is going up, not down. We're heading for 34% by the um, government's own measure, preferred measure, which um, is going to reach the peak of the 1990s. So this is going in the wrong direction, which is why children are going without beds. It's a symptom of child poverty. Given that 75% of children growing up in poverty live in a house where someone works, can the Chancellor, uh, sorry, Prime Minister not see that it's a very complacent response from him uh, and it just doesn't seem to be going to solve the problem? How is he going to solve child poverty? Uh, I, I just, I, I may, maybe we'll look at uh, different numbers, but the numbers that I know and I'm happily to share them with the committee are that there are, as I said previously, over a million people, fewer people, um, fewer people in absolute poverty than there were in 2010. Uh, now, the children component of that, I think, is 200,000 fewer children on that measure in absolute poverty, uh, fewer than there were in 2010. Uh, and again, about a million fewer workless households today uh, than in 2010. And again, uh, that is by far and away, I think, the biggest driver of a child growing up in poverty. Uh, I'm not remotely complacent about it. I don't want any child to grow up in poverty. Uh, it's awful to think that they are, and what we should do is continue to reduce it. We've made progress. There's always more to do. I think the most important way to help those children is to make sure that their parents are in good, well-paid jobs. Thank you. Uh, Prime Minister, I'm sure you will um, join me in wishing Steve Bryan well, who as chair of the health committee should be here, but unfortunately he's been taken ill with the flu and he's asked me to ask his questions for him. Um, we meet on the day of the second nurses strike and tomorrow of course we have the ambulance industrial action. The government has stressed we have an independent pay review process, but increasingly it seems to be something the other political parties and especially the trade unions don't believe in. How big a problem do you think this is and what do you propose to do about it? Well, it's worth bearing in mind that the pay review bodies have been in existence for a long time, accepted by uh, 
different political parties as a sensible part of the process. Um, they were used by previous Labour governments as well, and other non-conservative politicians have said that it wouldn't be right to cut across uh, the pay review bodies, uh, and they do exist because pay is, is obviously difficult, uh, and they exist to come to a sensible, considered and fair view, balancing all the competing interests about what reasonable and pay settlements are. Um, and, and that's why the government accepted them in full across the board, not just uh, for the NHS. Uh, and in many cases, those pay settlements were more than what the government had initially um, thought was uh, doable and uh, indeed higher in many cases than what was being offered in the private sector. So I think they are an important part of the process and the government has respected them. What reform of the pay review process would you like to see? I, I, I don't think I've said I, I do want to see a reform to it. Uh, um, and um, is that something that you would welcome the Health Committee having a look at? I, I, I wouldn't be for me to direct the uh, Health Committee to, on their investigations. I wouldn't dream of doing so. Um, but, Sounds like a no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I mean, they, they are set up to balance. I mean, the, the terms of reference are relatively straightforward. I mean, they're balancing what's affordable for the taxpayer, that's ultimately all these things have to be paid for, uh, with the need to make sure that we can recruit and retain staff in the various um, sectors in which they're operating. Those are, I don't think most people would quibble with those um, uh, as, as things for them to consider. Inflation is also important. Was well, not just important for us, it's been important for governments over the last few decades. And that's, that's an important part of what they do as well. Um, the pay review body will, of course, um, be looking again in the new year at NHS Pay and will report to you in the summer. And it now looks inevitable uh, that the process will provide a much better offer to the NHS then because of the uh, inflation figures. Um, <coughs> is that on the agenda for change for next year and with the promise of such, shouldn't the Royal College of Nurses actually call off their industrial action now? Um, this winter while we attempt to scale the COVID backlog and get the extra resources into social care to ease discharge and therefore the very real stress our ambulance crews are facing on a daily basis. I think with regard to inflation, the pay review bodies, when they do make their decisions, are aware of what forward estimates of inflation are and indeed that was the case for this year's estimates. Um, for inflation, which already were in, were in the evidence and, and in their considerations. And of course, you're right, there will be a, a, a body and a process for next year, which, uh, among any other things, the health secretary has been clear, our door is always open to, to talk to everybody and be constructive about how we approach these things in the future. Um, but that's uh, look, what, what I want to see is, you know, the NHS that is able to focus on reducing the backlogs improving the quality and, and timeliness of care that people are getting. That's why we've put billions of pounds of extra funding into both the NHS and social care, as, as you mentioned in the autumn statement, in spite of the other difficult decisions that needed to be made. So I think that represents a clear commitment from the government to the importance of the NHS, making sure it's funded well, but we do need to make sure that that money can actually now go and deliver for patients. So in short, what would be your personal message this Christmas to NHS workers and others who are taking strike action or contemplating strike action as we run up to Christmas? I've, I've always been very clear in, in expressing my gratitude and, uh, and admiration for our NHS workers and indeed our public sector workers across the board for the job that they do. I've acknowledged that it is difficult. It's difficult for everybody because inflation is where it is. And the best way to help them and to help everyone else in the country is for us to get a grip and reduce inflation as quickly as possible. And we need to make sure that the decisions that we make can bring about that outcome. Because if we get it wrong and, and we're still dealing with high inflation in a year's time, that's not going to help anybody. I don't want to see that. I want to see things get back to normal. And that's why having an independent pay process is an important part of us making those decisions and getting them correct. And that's why we've accepted those recommendations in full. Well, thank you, Prime Minister. I'm impartial about the quality of your answers, but the brevity is good. And we're on time. Uh, we're moving on to the last section of our questions, which is we've called the State of the Union, and it starts with the Chairman of the Scottish <coughs> Affairs Committee, Pete Wishart. Well, Prime Minister, nice to see you here. And I think this committee's disappointed we didn't get the opportunity to maybe hear from your predecessor, such was the pace of events over the course of the past few months. It's now been uh, four weeks since uh, the Supreme Court made its decision. 
that the Scottish Parliament didn't have the necessary powers to legislate for a Scottish independence referendum. What happens now? Well, as I think we respect the decision of the Supreme Court and we'll continue to focus on delivering for the people of Scotland and working constructively with the Scottish Government to do that. Well, what has happened, of course, is that there's now six opinion polls in a row that shows majority support for Scottish independence. And if there was an independence referendum tomorrow, I think there'd be a very good chance that Scottish independence would win. So, again, I ask you, how do we take this forward? How do we start to resolve the situation? I don't think you're expecting that those of us who support Scottish independence should take our ambitions for our nations away. So what is the UK government going to do to respond to the situation? This session is called State of the Union. It's certainly in a state when one part of it seems to want the option of leaving this union. Well, I, 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 I'm going to continue delivering for the people of Scotland. I think we've, we've talked about all the issues that the country is grappling with, whether it's inflation, the cost of living, yeah, more than anything else, but also making sure that we can uh, have health services that are responsive to people's needs, protecting our energy security, standing up to Russian aggression. You know, these are all really important issues, and I think on you know, many of them we can and will continue to work constructively with the Scottish Government to make a difference to, to, to people's lives. And that, that's very much my focus, and, and that's what I'll continue to do. Do you realise just how hollow and woeful that response sounds to the situation in Scotland as well. I mean, we want to resolve this democratically. We believe the Scottish people should decide their future. I think that's how most nations would approach this issue. Even the Labour Party have their own new constitutional plans that they're bringing forward. I think the Liberals still believe in federalism across the UK. You're not going to sit there and tell me you have no plans to deal with some of the constitutional difficulties issues that there is in Scotland just now. Surely you must have some sort of plan other than all the other things that you're going to be doing anyway. Well, actually, I, I mean, one thing that we're very keen to make sure we deliver is um, all the recommendations of the Smith Commission, which represented a significant transfer of power and responsibility to the Scottish Government, which is probably the most powerful devolved uh, parliament anywhere in the world. Uh, the Scotland Act 2016 set out all of those, and we want to work constructively with the Scottish Government to deliver on all of those as we are making good progress on and that kind of <coughs> represents, as I said, one of the biggest transfers of power that anyone has ever seen um, and that's, that, that's the UK Government respecting uh, the commitments that it made and delivering on them. See, we've all been asking you this from you all the way down to your senior ministers to the Secretary of State from Scotland. We've all asked, what do we do now? How do we actually move this forward? How do we start to accommodate the legitimate requirements of the Scottish people when it comes to deciding this constitutional future? We've not had any answer, and again, we're not getting any answer at all. The only thing we've had, I think, is from the Secretary of State from Scotland, who said, we'll just know when we get there, when the conditions will be right, and they gave the famous duck test. If it looks like a duck, was like a duck, you know the rest of it, Prime Minister. Is that what it is? Is that, is that, is that what we've got to wait for till you decide that the conditions are right for the Scottish people to have this opportunity to decide the constitutional future? No, I, I, look, my, my belief is that the Scottish people would like their governments, both their Scottish government and the UK government, to focus on the issues that are most pressing at the moment, given the scale of the challenges that we face. You know, I've been very clear that I want to do that in a constructive manner, I want to work in partnership where the Scot with the Scottish Government where we can, and I think we can, make a difference to people's lives. Uh, that's why I called the First Minister very shortly after assuming office, it's why uh, I attended the British Irish Council that brings together everyone from across our islands uh, in one place to discuss these issues, and you know, I will continue to operate in that spirit and, and hopefully make a difference on these issues that matter to people at this time. So here's something else we'll offer you and see if you could agree with this or not. The, the more you prevaricate on this, the more you sort of say no, your failure to engage into the legitimate demands of the Scottish people, the only thing that's going to happen surely is support for independence is going to continue to grow up and at some point you're going to have to sit down and deal with that. Why don't you just deal with that just now? Why don't you bring forward the necessary change in the legislation so we, we could do this? Because the, the other option surely is support for independence is going to go up and at some point you're going to have to address this. You do realise that, don't you? Well, I, what, what, what I'm focused on is actually making a difference to the lives of people in Scotland. I think uh, the challenges they face first and foremost are with the cost of living and the impact that's having on them. 
you know, I want to do everything I can to try and alleviate some of those burdens and provide opportunity and jobs for them. And I think we can do a lot of that in partnership with the Scottish Government when we work constructively together, and that's what I'm going to keep doing, and, and I think that's the right thing to do. Well, I think the Scottish people will be listening to these proceedings and will be very disappointed that you can't even offer one scenario that you're going to engage positively with what the Scottish people seem to want. But just lastly from me, Sir Bernard, if that's all right, like, um, you're the only senior government minister that was given a fixed penalty notice during Partygate. The, the other recipient of one, of course, is facing the Privileges Committee with some very serious <coughs> sanctions. Do you think that we've been unnecessarily hard on your predecessor, but one, or maybe too lenient, lenient on yourself? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've addressed that in the past, so I haven't got anything further to add, and I wouldn't, wouldn't be my place to comment on the Privileges Committee, which is obviously independent from government. But I would just say... You, disagree with something you said before about what Scottish people see about engaging positively. That's exactly what we are doing. Uh, we are engaging positively with the Scottish Government. That's why I called the First Minister shortly after taking office, indeed on the first day. It's why I went to, to see her and other devolved leaders very shortly after taking office, the first UK Prime Minister to attend that gathering since 2007. Uh, I think that serves as a demonstration that I do want to engage positively to make a difference I to the lives of people in, in Scotland. I could tell you yeah. I'm happy about uh, well, I think to that's the, I think that's the right, the right thing to do. I think, sense, I'm 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 think gonna gonna everybody can sense from your discomfort. And actually, I, I, you know, just, just recently, and when, when I was Chancellor, we made sure that we can invest directly in Scottish communities through the Leveling Up Fund. That, that, those investments are making a real difference on the ground for those communities, and Not I think working. that's an example of what we can do, and I'm going to keep doing more of it. I'd just like to point out that the references to the Privileges Committee have nothing to do with fixed penalty notices. They're about a completely separate matter. Um, as a member of the Privileges Committee, I think I'm entitled to say that. Um, Joanna Cherry. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. In September, the current Home Secretary told a fringe event at your party conference that ultimately the United Kingdom would need to leave the European Convention on Human Rights. And last week, when we had the Deputy Prime Minister and Lord Chancellor in front of the Joint Committee on Human Rights, I asked him about his position on the Convention, and he said, and I quote, the government's position is very clear, we rule nothing out, nothing is off the table for the future. So can you confirm whether you agree with your Home Secretary and whether the Deputy Prime Minister accurately described the position of your government to my committee? Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've been very clear, as I said previously, I want to deliver a, an immigration system, which means that when someone comes here illegally, they don't have the right to stay and we will be able to return them either to their own country where it's safe or a safe third country alternative where that makes sense. And we'll introduce the legislation next year and I'm, I'm confident we can deliver on the system that I want to yes, but, put in place. But what I asked you is whether the Home Secretary is correct to say ultimately we'll require to leave the, the Convention. Uh, as I said, we'll put in place the legislation next year and I'm sure we'll be discussing it at well, the time. Do you disagree with her? I, I, I don't think I was in government at the time that she made the comments, so I'm not familiar with it. But what I can tell you is the system that I'm going to deliver as Prime Minister that I'm working with the Home Secretary on. And we'll, you'll see the legislation next year, and, and no doubt we will have the opportunity to debate it then. But I wouldn't want to speculate on that now. Well, despite the high turnover of Prime Ministers, you were in government last week when the Deputy Prime Minister told me that it wasn't off the table. Is that correct? Leaving the Convention is not off the table for your government? I said, I, I want to fix this problem, right? And I'm going to do everything that I need to to fix the problem of illegal migration and small boats coming here. And we'll introduce legislation in the new year um, that will help us do that. As I said, there's lots of different things we need to do. Legislation is a part of it. Rwanda is a part of it. Our approach to Albania is a part of it. Um, but you know, I'm confident that we can deliver on all of these things. When will the bill, British Bill of Rights bill have a second reading? Uh, I don't have a specific date, as with all these things, it's when parliamentary time allows. Uh, has it been deprioritised in order to allow you to concentrate on the new immigration legislation you've just mentioned? I, I know, as, look, I'm, a, I'm a new Prime Minister, you would expect me to look at the entire legislative programme 
and and then make decisions on that basis. You know, some things we need to do sooner rather than later, and and as it is, for example, with Northern Ireland, where we had to make decisions because of the lack of a fun functioning executive. That meant that legislation had to be introduced uh, at that time, not something I was anticipating uh, beforehand. So, you know, th those are the types of things that come up. But you know, we're keen to deliver on illegal migration, and, and that's something that I said is a priority. Bill of Rights bill is very much Dominic Raab's baby, very much his pet project. If the allegations of bullying against him, which are currently being investigated, are found to be true and he has to resign, would that be the end of the Bill of Rights? I mean, I don't think you'd expect me to comment on, on either of that. I would just point out it was also a manifesto commitment uh, to update the Human Rights Act. But there wasn't a manifesto commitment to repeal and replace the Human Rights Act, was there? Uh, you know, there's lots of different ways of doing it, but I'm, I'm making the broader point that a commitment to update, uh, to update the Human Rights Act mm. you know, was there from 2019. Yeah, but my point is that Dominic Raab's bill doesn't update the Human Rights Act, it repeals it and replaces it with something else. <coughs> so are you saying that the option of simply updating it is still on the table? I was making the broader point that that's where the, the genesis of the, the policy comes from. But there are some very practical, sensible things that it, it, you know, it would be good, I think everyone hopefully would agree, you know, whether that's deporting more foreign national offenders who are using their Article 8 right to a family life to, to stop being deported, whether that's uh, convicted terrorists in prisons who are somehow able to use their right to socialise to stop being separated from other prisoners where we think actually that will cause more radicalization and indeed was the recommendation from an independent reviewer of, of counter-terrorism for us so you know where we're not able to deliver on those very sensible policy things because of the way the hri is being interpreted it seems entirely reasonable to look at how best to resolve those will your new immigration laws contain any provisions derogating from the european convention on human rights again i'm not i'm not going to speculate on future legislation now but i'm going to introduce legislation next year that will deliver on the immigration system that I want to see, which is if someone comes here illegally, that we will have the right to remove them uh, to either their own country or a safe third country alternative. They should not have the ability to stay here. Uh, that's, I think, quite frankly, a common sense position that is held by the vast majority of British people, and that's the system that I want to deliver. The Convention and the Human Rights Act are woven into the Scotland Act, which established the Scottish Parliament. And my committee's heard expert evidence that a consent motion will be required from the Scottish Parliament before the Human Rights Act could be repealed and indeed our cross-party committee of MPs and peers has recommended that you shouldn't proceed without that consent. Now you made great play to my colleague Pete Wishart a moment ago about your new agenda uh, with the Scottish Government and when you took over as Prime Minister you said you wanted to reset the relationship between Westminster and Holyrood and that the union between Scotland and England should be collaborative and constructive. So in that spirit Will you respect the vote of the Scottish Parliament if it withholds consent to the repeal of the Human Rights Act? Yeah, what I've said is I, I want to make sure that we work through the Seoul Convention processes, that there is good engagement and constructive dialogue, and that's what we will try and do. Yeah, but if the outcome of the process is the withholding of consent, will you respect that yeah. in the spirit of collaboration and constructive engagement that you've promised? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think anyone would expect all governments across the United Kingdom to agree on absolutely everything, but where we can, uh, where, where we can work collaboratively and constructively together, we will do. And even where we disagree, it's right to have engagement about those things. You know, that's the approach that I will take. Very short. You said a moment ago that the Scottish Parliament was the most powerful devolved parliament anywhere in the world. Wouldn't you expect such a powerful devolved parliament to be able to protect the human rights laws woven into its foundation document? You know, I'd expect the Scottish Parliament to continue delivering for its people on the things that matter, whether that's you know, schools or policing and working with the UK government where it makes sense. Prime Minister, would you welcome proposals from anybody uh, on how to deliver your objective of being able to uh, uh, either send people back to their home country or send people back to a safe country if they arrive, up, arrive here illegally um, from, for example, the Human Rights Committee or the SNP or the Labour Party? Um, would you consider those proposals? I, 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 I think I'm, I'm always happy to, uh, to hear uh, proposals, uh, Chair, and there's no shortage of them coming my way, I've discovered. So <laughs> I don't think anyone needs an invitation from me to give me their opinion. 
Um, Sir William Cash uh, from the European Scrutiny, the European Union Scrutiny Committee. We still have much European law in our system. Yes. Uh, Prime Minister, um, our statute book in the United Kingdom uh, is still really seriously affected <coughs> by accumulated and current EU law, even though we've less, left the EU. The European Scrutiny Committee has found this deeply disturbing and the interaction between our own statutes and European statutes includes our own current online safety bill and the European Union's own Digital Services Act. This is, there is an urgent need in particular for the protection of our children and our grandchildren in relation to this monstrous and evil state of affairs which is now stalking the land uh, where there is child, child sexual abuse and exposure of those children to harmful content online. I'm sure this is a matter of grave concern to you as well. Um, this is combining to destroy young people's lives and their families, even dr driving uh, some children to suicide, such as in the tragic case of Molly Russell. And the um, inquest proved that that was the case. There is massive secrecy, as we now know through lobby documents, which have recently been released by the Corporate European Observatory under Freedom of Information Procedures, within those institutions and the procedural labyrinth of the EU, including the Trialogue system, with big tech firms recently spending more than £27 million on lobbying in just one year, not only in the EU itself, but also here. We've tabled and are now drafting further amendments to our online safety bill to impose personal criminal liability on those and including imprisonment for those senior managers who willfully fail to comply with their statutory safety duties and who by the abuse of their platforms and algorithms fail to protect children from online harm. In this matter, we are fully supported by the NSPCC and by other children's charities and by very many MPs across the floor of the House in the national interest. Can I ask you this, please? Do you appreciate this, the nature and the scale of this problem? And would you therefore meet myself and others in the first week of the new year, before the report stage on the 16th of January, to ensure that our own online safety bill is amended to include the concept of safety controllers and so that senior directors and managers will be made personally and criminally responsible if their service fails to comply with children's safety duties, which has resulted in profound tragedy and harm to our children, whatever the European Union has itself decided to legislate for itself. Will you please give me some clear understanding that you will support the proposals of the NSPCC and myself and others in this, in this matter? Well, first of all, I think this is a really important piece of legislation for exactly the reasons that you outlined, Seville, at the moment are, you know, our children are not as safe as they deserve and need to be online. And our bill, I think, is a world-leading piece of legislation that's been designed to ensure that large tech companies take more responsibility for the safety of their users, particularly uh, children. Uh, there's strong protections in there um, for our <coughs> children. They've been welcomed by stakeholders across the board. And to your point on the powers that we have to hold them to account, Ofcom will now be able to find them, or will be able to find them, up to 10% of their global turnover, which is obviously very significant. It can obviously direct them to make specific improvements uh, to their platforms. <coughs> um, it can force, uh, it can force third-party services to remove content, uh, and senior managers are under the bill already able to face criminal sanctions if their company doesn't comply with uh, Ofcom's requirements. Um, I know that the culture secretary has been engaging with with all parties uh, widely. The bill has been widely supported, not just by all the former. Secretaries of State, but by children's groups and others, um, and, and I say it's something that we are leading the world in, uh, and I'm sure she'll continue to engage with colleagues as, as the bill makes its way through Parliament. Uh, 
But didn't you accept the premise from which I've set out the question I put to you in <coughs> asking you if you would meet with us to discuss these matters? Because unfortunately there is a serious lacuna here and the criminal responsibility to which you refer is one stage removed, it is not direct, and it does not deal with the problem as the NSPCC and others have, have clearly stated. Okay, I'm, I'm sure the Culture Secretary will continue to engage on the specific detail, but as I said, the principle of the bill, as far as I understand it, and what we want to achieve is that senior managers could face criminal sanctions if the company doesn't comply with Ofcom's uh, particular information requirements, but I'll happily have the Culture Secretary pick that up. Then. So, Prime Minister, something to look forward to in the new year, a meeting with Sir William Cash. I'll, I'll, I, will, I, will get, I will get the Culture Secretary to pick it up uh, immediately. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Thank you, Sir William. Uh, Sir Bob Neill for the Justice Committee. Good to see you, Prime Minister. How seriously do you take the government's obligation under the Constitutional Reform Act to uphold the independence of the judiciary and to uh, provide adequate resource for the efficient discharge of the justice system? Um, of, of course I'm committed to the uh, independence of the judiciary, uh, Sir Bob, it's um, absolutely a cornerstone of how I see the world. Uh, and you're right about resourcing. Uh, I think we've, we're investing about £138 million additionally into the criminal legal aid sector, for example, and we've already implemented, I think, a 15% increase to most fee schemes. I know it's something that you've um, thought about and, and mentioned in, in the past. And I think in sum, it will mean that our criminal legal aid lawyers will receive the biggest boost to their compensation in, in some decades. Would you accept as a situation where, despite that investment, which I recognise, uh, people can be waiting for two years for a serious sexual offence case to be heard, or a small business can wait 18 months uh, for a money claim or a contract dispute to be resolved, it is not really efficient. Yeah, I, look, we, we absolutely have a challenge with the backlog in our court system. I think. I've, it, we were making progress as a result of COVID, let's be clear, and that's why the spending review um, in 2021, we allocated almost half a billion extra pounds over the rest yeah. of the Parliament to try and get those backlogs down. We were making progress until the, uh, the barristers strike, um, but we need to now obviously redouble our efforts. Some of the things we are doing is recruiting up to a thousand new judges and removing the limit on the sitting days. Um, also providing more support for remote hearings and uh, the continued operation of Nightingale Courts. I think all of those initiatives will help us move through the backlog. I, you're absolutely right, though. We want people to have swift and timely access to justice, so this deserves our attention and it's getting it. I believe you're due to meet the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales in the new year. Will you make a point of particular listening to the concerns he has raised with the Justice Committee uh, about the, the, the senior judiciary have uh, about uh, the delays and pressures on the system as it currently stands? Yeah, I, I look forward to meeting him and having that conversation. Do you also accept that legal certainty is important for British business and for investment in the UK? Yes, I think that you, you're right actually as well about that. It's not just the individuals, but for business as well, it's important that we have timely justice and certainty. How does a provision that would automatically cause over two, three thousand pieces perhaps of uh, retained EU legislation to expire automatically at the end of 2023, as currently proposed, add to business certainty? Well, I, I think on, on that point, it's, it's right that we look at the stock of retained EU law that we've got and make sure that we as a UK Parliament have decided what we want to keep, yes. what we want to flex and change, uh, you know, and, and I want to move on with that as quickly as possible. Now, you know, there, there are some provisions in the bill, as, as you know, for a flexibility around doing that, but I, I do think it's right that we make progress on this. Uh, but are you open to some flexibility on the time limit? No, but it's, it's about chance. making sure it's, it's, it's about making sure that we can do this properly, which is what we're going to do. I think you know we, we, the referendum was about several years ago. I think it's appropriate that we look at our statute book and say, hang on, which bits of these that we we grandfathered in deliberately at the time for practicality. Now, which bits of these do we actually think are right for the UK? And, and it may well be that bits of them are, and that would be straightforward, but there will certainly be areas, and particularly in those areas of our economy where we want to see growth, whether that's in life science, 
that's in the sort of digital and data financial <coughs> services as we're reforming already in professional services, yes. where we will want to take advantage of the new flexibilities and sovereignty we have to do things differently, to create opportunity in this country. I think that's really important, in demonstrating some of the benefits of, of the freedoms that we have from Brexit. Um, but I, I, I believe we need to do it quickly to provide the certainty that you're right, people um, should expect. It does quickly mean arbitrarily, or is it just doing it thoroughly? No, we, we could do it. We should do it quickly and thoroughly. Um, but I think you know, look, what people are should be focused on, and what are the practical changes that we are going to make that will make things better in the UK. That's what I'm focused on. I'm focused on being able to say, here are the things that we're going to change, and these are the things, benefits that will flow from them. What one final point, if I may, and that's this: um, <coughs> you, you've referred when you became prime minister to delivering on our 2019 manifesto commitment. Um, our 2019 manifesto commitment has already been referred to in that we would uh, uh, update uh, human rights uh, and administrative law. Uh, and, of course, made no mention, no suggestion at all that we would ever leave the Convention. I don't think you've ever suggested that, Prime Minister, have you? You know, what, the reason, I think the reason we're having this conversation is with regard specifically to illegal migration. And, yes. and I, I'm clear about the system that I want to deliver. And, uh, you know, lots of theories people will have, but the example I point people to is that of Albania. Yes. And people said, well, you, you, know, you have to leave the ECHR if you want to fix this problem. I made the point that, hang on, lots of other European countries, in fact, yes, the vast majority of them, all reject close to 100% of Albanian Germany. cases. Yeah. So uh, they're all signatories to ECAT, they're all signatories yeah. to the ECHR. Okay. So Very we must be able to fix the problem we have with illegal migrants from Albania. Well, in terms of updating, uh, and I take your point, and I agree with you, in terms of updating and saying within the Convention, as those countries have, Will you have another look uh, at the report by Sir Peter Gross uh, on the independent review of the Human Rights Act, which suggested updating and a number of specific changes in the areas, uh, uh, including those which you and I have just been discussing, around migration, uh, extraterritoriality, and other practical matters? Will yeah, you that is a potential way forward. I will, I will, uh, here, I'm going to defer to, <laughs> to your expertise on this. Um, I think, we're, you know, I'm grateful to Sir Peter for his. Um, and his panel, in fact, actually, for their report. And I know the Justice Secretary and the government have considered the report in producing its own consultation in this area, which I know Bobby will be more familiar with than, than I probably am. Um, but I think we're taking on board some of the spirit of, of the suggestions, for example, emphasis on common law, but I'll happily take that away as well. Thank you. Joe, forgive me, I've got to let some other people in first. I'll let you in if there's time. Philip Dunn. Very Additional point, Prime Minister, in relation to a department where the, which is at risk of overload because of the backlog of work, and that's within DEFRA. Uh, you announced recently that you're intending to extend the current session of Parliament till autumn 2023. One of the pieces of legislation which is expected to be concluded during the course of 2023 is the retained EU law revocation and reform bill. That <coughs> includes a vast number of uh, pieces of legislation stemming from the EU relating to the environment. There is no clarity at this point as to uh, where, where the process of reviewing those laws has got to, and therefore there's a lot of concern that there may be some wholesale changes to environmental law undertaken at short notice of little ability for either House of Parliament to review them. Could you give us some clarity and uh, ab about the timetable for that bill, about the extent to which the DEFRA ministerial team could be directed to start working within the department uh, and, and give some reassurance that the environmental <coughs> provisions are not going to be um, disturbed wholesale. Yes, um, I, we've already committed, Philip, I think during the second reading of the rural bill, that the bill would not weaken environmental protections. Right, so that commitment has already been made. You know, what we want to do is use the powers in the bill to ensure that our own environmental law is functioning and able to drive the continued uh, improved environmental outcomes that you and I and I think everyone wants to see and making sure that the UK regulatory framework is tailored and appropriate for our own country. I think you'd also just look at the proof points. We've already introduced Fisheries Act, Agriculture Act, Environment Act. Those are all ambitious reforms to all those areas post leaving the EU, which I think we've done successfully and you know, world leading in many cases. And we've already repealed over 140 bits of retained EU law um, in, the, in the DEFRA space, particularly the European Fisheries Control Agency, for example. Now, in terms of process from here, there's a public dashboard, I think, that DEFRA have put in place. They're working through it. And we expect that dashboard to be updated in the new year to, to, rep uh, to reflect the full extent of the rural regulations that we think are in, uh, are in scope. I'm looking forward to continue working with you and others to make sure that we get this right. 
Thank you. On this subject, one minister told me that um, officials are being constrained from drafting uh, replacement regulations and consulting on them because they're not allowed to do that until the legislation is on the statute book. Um, can I suggest that you <coughs> should authorise departments to start drafting and consulting on the replacement regulation from now so that as soon as the uh, statute is approved um, they can get on with um, the parliamentary process of scrutinising all this stuff because that's where the bottleneck is going to, going to exist. Uh, yes, I, I will certainly take, take that away. Um, but there's a, there's a body of work to be done. Um, thank you. Robin Walker. Yeah, uh, as a member of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, I particularly welcome the fact that you did attend the British Irish Council, and uh, I think that was important. There are strong rumours that the UK and the EU are working towards a Valentine's Day, Day agreement on the protocol. Are you confident that an agreement will be in place in time for the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement to be back up and running uh, for the very important anniversary next year? Well, I, you know, I've been clear, actually, that I haven't put a, an arbitrary or strict deadline on the conversations that we're having, and I don't think that that's necessarily helpful, and I don't want to you know, unnecessarily raise people's expectations of <coughs> a breakthrough. You know, what I am committed to doing is working constructively with our European partners to see if we can find a way through this to resolve the very clear challenges that the protocol presents to Northern Ireland's place in the Union. I want to see those problems fixed. Fixed. I want to protect Northern Ireland's place in the Union. I'm, and uh, the Foreign Secretary met with um, uh, Rinda Sefcovic just recently, and, and those talks are ongoing. Thank you. And uh, one issue that affects every part of the UK um, in the education space is the, the issue of international students. There's been a uh, recent suggestions that there could be some kind of a crackdown or reduction uh, in the numbers. And yet, when I visited universities, whether it's Queen's, Belfast, Cardiff, Glasgow, or indeed Worcester, uh, they all value the international students, both the economic and cultural benefits that they bring. I remember when I was at the DfE, we celebrated hitting the milestone, the target of 600,000 uh, international students as a, an unequivocally good thing. Uh, do you think that is um, a target we should continue to uh, pursue? Do you think we should go further? Uh, or, or do you think there is actually some reason to reduce the numbers? No, I just, I first of all, I think international students do make a significant economic and cultural contribution to the UK's higher education sector and indeed the UK. I think they enrich the university experience uh, for all students, actually, um, and it's a good thing. And I think the, the point just to recognise is the target that we'd set of 600,000 was for 2030, and you know, we met it several years earlier. I think that's, um, you know, some sort of sign of success, but obviously it just causes one to look at the situation. But you know, I think no one is doubting the, uh, the contributions that those students make to the UK and the economy. And, and do you agree, given all our universities are elite institutions, the suggestions of only allowing some to welcome international students and not others is a non-starter? Look, I mean, it's, not, it's not something that we, you know, I've, I've spoken about. I want to make sure that we, we attract the best and the brightest to the UK. That's something that we would always want to do. Um, you know, there's a global competition for talent, and we want to make sure, actually, funnily enough, our, our visa system for highly skilled people is very competitive. Uh, those are the, the reforms that we've put in place. We'll always continue to attract people here. We just want to make sure that people, when they're here, are contributing one way or another. I think that's an important foundation of a proper migration system. Thank you, Prime Minister. Finally, there's uh, been briefing that you're looking at a British baccalaureate for uh, post-16. Um, given we're talking about the union, uh, what conversations have there been with the devolved of administrations about that, given that education is wholly devolved in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales? Uh, and how can we call it a British baccalaureate if it's England only? Yeah. I think that in the main focus of, as the Secretary of State, I think probably uh, said previously at the Select Committee, is about looking at maps, actually, is something that I've spoken about in the past. And you know, we are uh, an outlier country in uh, the kind of lack of... Uh, maths study after 16 compared to almost everyone else and we um, we certainly lag behind uh, numeracy when it comes to young adults or we significantly lag behind the OECD average and given how important that is for people's opportunities in life and their ability to have good jobs I think it's worth us looking at that and seeing you know whether we've got things as we would like them if we're really focused on making sure that our children, our grandchildren have a fantastic future ahead of them. Thank you. I should have just mentioned that uh, Mr Walker is standing in for the chair of the Northern Ireland Committee who couldn't be here today. 
and he serves on the Northern Ireland Committee I, as I, well I, as chairing the Education Committee. How he finds the time for that, I don't know. <laughs> well done. Um, Catherine McKinnell. Thank you, Chair. Um, given you said it will be one of the first things that you do, and you've already outlasted the last Prime Minister, <laughs> where is your independent ethics advisor? Yes, I, I'm hopeful I can make an announcement on that on that soon. You know, I'm, it's important to me to get someone who I think is is right for the job. And you know, rest assured, I'm I'm hard at it. And I said, I hopefully we can have an announcement soon. Okay, um, and I appreciate you can't comment on ongoing legal proceedings, but do you regret ignoring the warnings about lack of basic checks, which have estimated? Um, resulted in an estimated £6.7 billion pounds of public money being wasted to fraud on COVID contracts. Yeah, again, I've, I've addressed this extensively uh, in, in the House and in the interest of finishing on time and keeping my answer short. Uh, absolutely no tolerance for people who have defrauded the system. It's wrong, particularly at a time of crisis, and they will be uh, relentlessly and rigorously pursued, as they already are being. They've had uh, dozens and dozens of arrests, billions of pounds uh, recovered, uh, and specialist agencies set up to, to go after people who have perpetrated this. But I would say that the, the newest estimates of fraud uh, across some of the schemes during uh, coronavirus are now, not only have they reduced by a third from where they were, they're now either in line or lower than the fraud that you would expect from a typical government programme. And considering the speed and scale at which they were implemented, actually is, um, it is positive, but there's obviously work to do and we will keep going after people. The question was, do you, do you regret ignoring the warnings? Uh, I, I, I actually don't think that's the right characterisation at the time, if anything, and I could, in the interest of time, I won't go into it, I could regale you with many quotes from many politicians from all parties about how we weren't going fast enough in removing checks and bureaucracy from the business's ability to uh, Can access Can I just press loans. you on one thing? When you were Chancellor, you lost a minister in the Lords who f was very clear that he did not feel that this was being treated seriously enough in the clearing up operation. What has changed since then? I, actually, many of the things that he mentioned are already happening. Um, whether it's a new public sector fraud authority, more resources into the uh, crime fighting agencies, more arrests. A dashboard was something that he was particularly concerned about, which was already being implemented, uh, which is important for comparability of statistics across different lenders, for example, uh, and recovery and bounce back loads. All those types of things are actually uh, were being implemented and are being implemented. Right, we are now a minute over time, but please could you give us uh, time for two one liners? Joanna Cherry. You mentioned a British baccalaureate there. I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but it would, of course, be an English baccalaureate, wouldn't it? Because education is fully devolved, and Scottish students already do a wider range of subjects at their higher level than in England. Yes, as I said, the focus is on my focus was looking at maths. Post yeah, but my point is, it wouldn't be a British baccalaureate; it would be an English one because education is fully I, devolved to the Scottish Parliament. I'm not actually talking about baccalaureate. I was just talking about actually people studying more maths after the age of sixteen. That doesn't mean it's in a baccalaureate. There's lots of different yeah. ways people. But you accept my point? Maths. Yeah, it was the same point that Robin made. No, it's not. It's a different point. My point was, if there was to be a British baccalaureate. It would not be a British baccalaureate, it would be an English one, because education is fully devolved to the Scottish Parliament. It's not a trick question, Prime Minister, no, it's just no, a no, I, I, mean, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a statement of fact, and I think it's the same point that Robin made. I wasn't dis disagreeing with it. Well, I'm, it I'm, it's I'm, actually a shorthand that people use because of the alliteration for having a broader qualification. I don't think it's meant to be in any way a reflection on the devolution yeah. settlement. I, I, I literally think it, that's all it was. I, and I was talking about maths post-16. Uh, yeah, but my point is... No, no, I think you've made your point. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Sherry, um, Alicia Cairns, last uh, question. You, the original integration review failed to reference Taiwan explicitly, despite Xi Jinping's clear intention, the fact that 40% of all global trade goes through the South China Seas, if you include the Malacca Strait as well, 80% of all semiconductor chips produced, and the fact that if there was an illegal invasion, the effect on the worldwide economy would truly be crippling. So can you please assure us that there will be explicit reference to Taiwan within the IR refresh, because otherwise we are not learning the lesson of Ukraine, where Putin told us time and time again that he was going to invade and we just didn't believe it, alongside the need to reference the current situation in the Balkans, where we see escalating conflict between Serbia and Kosovo and the undermining of the sovereignty of Bosnia-Herzegovina, where we have explicit commitment and requirements to uphold peace and security there. All voted. That's not a yes, though, is it? Well, I'm not going to write the IR right here and now, but all all things that you would expect, I would go over as we're refreshing it. Prime Minister, you've um, 
We've not been as generous with your time as your predecessors, but we're very, very grateful you managed to fit us in before Christmas. And um, uh, you've also answered the questions very, very fully. Um, whether satisfactorily or not is not a matter for me. But thank you very, very much, and I'm sure the committee would like to wish you and your family a very good Christmas, and I certainly wish the rest of my committee a good Christmas as well. Thank Order. you, and Merry Christmas. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.